soon as it's right, over 90% of the time, they'll start to believe it. And sure enough, what we saw was as soon as we would have a missed response time, and we go back through and look at the data and say, hey, you weren't really covered to post this area. Yeah, you know, I've been here 12 years, and I always post southeast second. Yeah, but now we kind of know where we need to be. Yeah, I'll be paying more attention. And we kind of saw that cultural transition, which again, improved our efficiency significantly. So this is actually now configured that I have the two big wall displays, and then on their four screen station, they actually have a duplicate map. So instead of having to look up all the time, they can have it right there in front of them, depending on which of the positions they're in. Do you have much um, resistance there based on you know, job fears? We initially, I think we did. And a lot of it too, and, and this was something that we couldn't discount, played to experience. I had some very experienced people in the department that have been doing this a long time. And what I actually kind of coached them to see was, this model didn't disagree with them very often. Their intuition and their experience actually was very similar to what it showed. Um, and that's because things hadn't changed a lot in the city. You know, we know, especially on a nice sunny day, around San Mateo and Central is going to be an active area for EMS calls. There's a large transient population, there's a lot of other things going on. That population will move to downtown around lunchtime and then kind of transition back. The rescue mission will get busy at night. Things like that, are the, and they're very predictable. And so it was kind of not discounting the experience for the employees and saying, you know, I know you've been here 20 years, but this is the way I need you to do it. It was helping them understand, hey, you've been here 20 years, but are you sure Sunday at 2 a.m. that you know how posting is supposed to work? Well, no, because I do it the same all the time. Okay, but it shouldn't be the same all the time. Do you understand why? And once we kind of got them to follow the concept, it worked very well. There were a couple of people that just stayed resistant. And you guys know, you're always going to have your outliers. So that's where you use your other management tools. You know, put some paid for performance goals on it. Post it as a metric. And then let them fall out naturally. You don't really need to be up on them all the time. Um, for us, obviously, there's a clinical concern. And so if we saw things that were, we just had a gross outlier where somebody wasn't paying attention, we manage that in the moment because that's important. Um, you know, my folks live in the city, I live in the city. If one of us has to call 911, I expect we're gonna get good service. And you guys have that same expectation. So another piece of what we did for RCA was develop this form that actually goes out with the supervisor. Um, now we're on the transition of sending this electronically, which is a big deal for us, so that we can send it to the suit. And it has all the things we measure. You know, did the dispatcher handle the call? Did, it, did the unit get the call? Did it show up on their map? Did they get paged when they should have? If not, could they find it in the map book? Did they ask for a routing? Because we can route them from the cab. Um, and then what did our time shake out like? Also, how many calls were in progress at a given time? And how many ambulances did we have? Because if something falls out, then I know, okay, this was a staffing issue. Um, this is another piece of our, our root cause analysis. So the form's been really helpful. This is a, a screenshot from Atwork where it's gonna give optimal routing. And, um, what you see for the balloons is your GPS tags. And Atwork's actually gonna make a recommendation based on impedance or drive time in a, in a certain area, what it thinks efficient routing would look like. And so your white balloons, this is my ambulance where they were initially positioned. Here's where the call was. They took, which wasn't a horrible route, except right here, when we zoom this to the sat map, they actually turned into a neighborhood here because the street name sounded like the street name they were going to. It was spelled differently, um, but this was a familiarity thing. They were in Rescue Sixes area and they're like, oh, Vanderhoven's right over here. Mm, that was Vanderhaven, actually. And so preferred routing is the purple line. Actual routing was a white balloon. So what we do then is go back to the crew and say, hey, we had a miss on this. Um, what happened with your routing choice? Oh, you know, that was Vanderhoven. We turned on the wrong street. Perfect. It's just information. We're just doing measurement. It's not something we're going out to whack the crews. You know, all the guys pay attention, you know. Um, and that helped us set that cultural tone of we're doing improvement here. We're measuring defects. It's information. This isn't about being punitive. But this was a great tool for us to have on the tablets because in the moment um, it got everybody focused. And now the crews know. If they miss response time, they know. They'll expect to see a supervisor at the hospital. They're already kind of formulating a lot of times their, their conversation. Oh, you know. Um, but what we did right off the front end was trim a lot of those, oh, I was in Starbucks, oh, Johnny didn't have his pager. The, the things that we knew we needed to manage kind of fell out right away. <clears throat> and then, of course, you guys are familiar with these tools. These were new to us. We took our defect measurements from RCA and laid them out as Pareto to say, what do we need to improve? You know, th 
things that we saw immediately were routing and navigation problems. So we talked to a crew, and you know, I'm a lifelong resident of Albuquerque, but even for me, and I've been on an ambulance a long time, even for me, there's times where a call will pop up, and I'm like, I don't know, is the academy better? Should we take Wyoming? What do you think? Wow. Well, that actually went to our second defect point, which is TTFM, time to first move. And this would be, I receive the call and go on route, but I don't move right away, because I'm not exactly sure what the best way to go is. So what we did was use this to drive an improvement. We took this information, looked at what was available to remedy these problems, worked with our software vendor, and we're putting actually in testing right now uh, a software program called the Zoll Navigator, which provides real-time routing in the ambulance. So instead of going back after the fact and saying, hey, it looks like Montgomery would have been a better choice, this will actually tell you when you get the call. It's got turn-by-turn -turn directions. You can use voice if you want and it routes you to the call in the most efficient manner. So it's a big deal, even for people like me that are, are residents. And remember, I've got national applicants coming in. They're licensed paramedics and I hire them. They have no idea where Paseo is. And by the time they clear training, they have a rough idea. And that's fine if I say, you're going to Paseo, Wyoming. But if I say, you're going to Buenos Aires and Chaluca Street, nobody knows where that is, right? Now I can route them right there. Um, that's one of those where there was front end expense Right? But if I can eliminate these two primary defects just by doing that, now look at where I'm at in terms of performance. That's where we like to be. So a big deal for us was alignment. We had to find a way to get all the team members on the same page, um, establish those daily targets, give the staff real-time performance goals and reporting um, somewhat insidiously. We used to pay for performance goals. Presbyterian has a system set up for evaluations that are done annually but they'll give you a target and say, hey, if you meet this target, you, you get a raise of X percent. If you hit this target, it'll be X percent. If you hit here, you consistently exceed your targets, you get this percent. So now there's a financial motivation for high performance, which is exactly the, the kind of tool that we want to leverage when we can in making improvements. So we put in PFP goals for response time compliance. Um, and then we set that new culture of, of trust and accountability. Our new executive director came in and he said, this is what we're going to do. I am going to trust you to do the right thing. If you do not, I'm going to hold you accountable. That hadn't been done in our organization in a long time, and we had suffered because of it. As soon as we started doing it that way, the outliers shook right to the bottom. The mid-level performers kind of brought it up where they needed to be, and we started trimming that bottom edge of the staff because that wasn't where we were going. And um, one of my favorite quotes, this is actually from our administrator, Clay, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I believe that's firmly true, especially based on what I've seen. Um, we went in and sat and talked about the ways to get this done, but what we saw is we couldn't get buy-in, and we allowed that culture of cynicism and sarcasm to kind of fester there. We weren't going to make the improvements we wanted. And this goes back to your formula, you know, about acceptance. You know, we know that if we can get people to buy in, we're going to see things improve. So the tool that we found to align everyone, we actually borrowed from a benchmark agency and then um, innovated it. And they use what's called a pulse process. So every day at noon, all the senior leaders from all the departments get together. It's open to the field crews. It's open to anybody who wants to come. We invite people from other industries in um, to look and see how we're doing business. And we look at our performance months to date, the day before, and that day in the moment. We look at utilization of the resources. We're going to project based on historical call volume what we think is going to come in. We're going to project the workload, and then we're going to look and see, is that where we came in? Um, what's the variability and what else is going on. We do late response review. So those RCAs that we talked about are part of this meeting. They're presented every day by the dispatch supervisor. So we look at all our failure points as a team every day. Um, then we'll talk about special events, system analysis, the Lobos home game, especially if the Lobos are popular. Big deal for us. We've got to shift based on who's going to be there and how early tailgating starts. Um, the Bloom and Fiesta, obviously, huge influx of population, right? What we saw is call volume didn't really change but geographically where the calls were shifted all over to that north side of town. And then the last thing we do, which is a great way to close any meeting, excellence. We sit and recognize members of the team that did something great. So-and-so paramedic had a delivery in the back of the ambulance. Baby boy's gonna fly. Good stuff, the kind of stuff that keeps people involved. This is an example of our real-time response uh, time compliance reporting. So a 10-minute response and a 13-minute priority two response, this is what our metrics look like. And we sit and look at this every single weekday, Monday through Friday, and then on Monday we get together and look at the weekend. And um, the cool thing for us is this is available in the moment to
to my dispatch team, to my supervisors, to the field crews. So that if we want to look and see how's our performance today, if you only have a second, you can just say, it's green, good, next. And if you really want to drill it down, you can say, okay, hey, call volume is kind of high for this time of the day. Where are we missing at? Well, let's take a look. City priority ones. 31 is kind of a lot for this time of day. I wonder what's going on. Then we're going to go back and look at all these misses and see what happened. Um, this was huge. Now I have my team focused on making sure these responses were met. And I had a couple people who got to where they almost took it personally. Um, exactly where we want it to be culturally, right? And this is our pulse. This is the mega graphic that, that we designed. Um, EMS looks at demand in two ways. Um, primarily, most services use what's called a stouting demand, where they're going to look at time of day, day of week, how many calls came in, and try and staff for that. We actually looked at a, what's called a two-tiered demand for us, where we looked at consumption. Yeah, that call came in in the 11 o'clock hour, but it came in at 11.58. And so we can put it in the bucket for 11 o'clock, but we've got to look at what time it took to ramp, because it may have taken until 1.02. And now I actually have it bleeding across, and that allowed us to kind of map that out as consumption. So our mega graphic, super busy, super loud. Um, what we did then was teach our entire team what it meant, what they were looking at. Um, we've got response time compliance. We've got what optimal staffing would have looked like. We've got who actually showed up. We've got vehicles in or out of service because that's what we can really provide. Now, we've got 10 ambulances in the system, but one blows a tire, got to take that out. Right? In that time frame, I want to know that's what happened so I can start looking. We run a 20-week demand, and then we look at trends for a 10 and a 3-week to be sure that we're shooting. And then the way we lay this with the statistical calculation is so 90% of the time our data is going to fall below that red line. So if I staff with inefficiency in mind and what I can afford in mind to that red line, I'm going to make compliance. The math is right. Um, then we look at our emergency call volume, our non-emergency volume, how many people as an overall we transported, and then the lines behind the consumption is our total mission time. So when you see an hour like this where it's extremely busy and almost to what our demand is forecast, you're going to see bleed over. Units were not on calls in here. Or, I'm sorry, units were still on calls, but that's not when the call occurred. The call occurred in here, and this is what we were talking about is needing to measure that. Because if I just look at the bars, if I have a failure in this hour, I'm not going to see that I had units still busy. And this was a great way for us to approach it. Here's our data that we dump into this integrated spreadsheet every day. Um, obviously, I hide a lot of other stuff in the spreadsheet with demand. Um, and you know, we're looking at the entire day. It's a picture we're plotting a bunch of data points. I don't 